Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. As we kick off our new series, we're titling The Ministry of Jesus. I want to remind you of something historical about the life of Vince Lombardi, and I'll tie it into our clip here in just a moment. But when Vince Lombardi took over the Green Bay Packers in 1958, one of the first questions the local press asked him was, what are you going to change to turn this team around after a string of failures and losing seasons? Sound familiar? How many of you still believe in the Cleveland Browns? Uh, You have a lot more faith than I do right now. But Lombardi's response was, I'm not going to change anything. We're going to use the same players, the same plays, the same training system. What we are going to concentrate on becoming brilliant at the basics. When Jesus launched his ministry, he masterfully took a group of ordinary people like you and I, taught them the basics, and released them to change the world. Jesus did it using three basic strategies that define his model for ministry that not only gave birth to Christianity as we know it, but it gave birth to the church that Jesus died for. This morning, as we begin our new series titled The Ministry of Jesus, I want to draw to your attention the fact that when Jesus came on the scene, church, without question, not only was he bloodied, using the phrase from our clip this morning, but it cost him his very life because Jesus introduced a new way of doing things. In our clip this morning, was from the movie Moneyball, Uh, the challenge and what what was being referred to in our clip was the fact that the the general manager of the Oakland A's uh, implemented a new model. It was a statistical model that is being used by many major league teams today that evaluated player talent. And in 2002, the Oakland Athletics won 103 games. It cost them $41 million dollars. That same year, the New York Yankees, they too won 103 games, but it cost them $126 million in a much more dramatic fashion. Jesus' ministry was patterned after a new model, a new way of doing things that brought about radical change on the religious front. In his model, Jesus did Three basic things that we are called as Christians to embrace, to to honor. Three basic things that the church has been called to give itself to 24-7. We find it in Matthew chapter 4, and actually there's a repeat of it in Matthew's gospel in the ninth chapter. Let's begin reading in verse 23, if you're with me following in the scripture, which I encourage you to do, the Fourth chapter, verse 23, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And we ask, Father, in this series, that by the special gifting and influence of the Holy Spirit is is you speak your word through my lips, Lord those that participate in this series, Lord, that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart that is ready to to say yes to you, to embrace truth, Lord, which we know has the power to bring transformation in our lives. Help us to catch the vision of of what the ministry of Jesus is supposed to look like in our community and in our lives, Father, as we're endeavoring to be Christ followers. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to be our teacher and to be our guide in this series. And may it truly be transformational for us, we pray. In Jesus' name. The threefold ministry of Jesus was real simple. This is the basics for us spiritually. It was teaching, preaching, and healing. Teaching, preaching, and healing. He went from city to city, from village to village. He taught in their synagogues, the scripture says. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. He healed all manner of sickness and disease from the inside out. You need his healing touch today. That ministry is still just as viable today as it was back then or 2,000 years ago. 
when Jesus officially launched out in his public ministry. We're told in the fourth chapter of Luke's, Luke's gospel that when Jesus came into the synagogue, as was his custom, that meant that Jesus went to church on the weekend He embraced that as a practice and a habit. Then when he launched into his public ministry after having fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and being tempted and attacked and taunted by the adversary in the wilderness, Jesus comes into the temple and he opens up the scripture and he reads because public reading of scripture was part of the custom and the practice of the day. And he reads out of Isaiah chapter 61. And he's quoting Isaiah chapter 61, which is a messianic prophecy. And he's indicating by the reading and the presentation of what he does that he is the fulfillment of that prophecy. It almost costs him his life at that time. But with the help of the Father, he passed through that moment. But this is what the scripture says. This is what he quotes from. In Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19, Out of the book of Isaiah, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And we see the components of preaching and teaching in his ministry as he launched from the get-go. Josephus, the... Jewish historian tells us in the day of Christ that there was approximately 200 villages and cities in a 40 by 70 mile area, 40 miles wide, 70 miles long. The smallest of those villages and cities was about 15,000 individuals. So if you do the math, there was approximately within that area of Galilee about three million people, the majority of which had exposure to the ministry of Jesus because his strategy was to teach and to preach and to heal from village to village and city to city. That was the model that Jesus implemented. And for the next two weeks, I want to talk to you about one of the components, and we're going to look at all three of these in our series, but I want to first begin with the preaching component of this model because church, when Jesus came, Like John the Baptist, he came preaching, he came proclaiming, the scripture says, the gospel of the kingdom. Two components to that. The kingdom of God, which by definition is God's rule and reign over the hearts and the minds of men. What is that supposed to look like for you and I in this life and the life to come? Jesus came preaching about the kingdom. He said it was the gospel of the kingdom because the word gospel literally means good news. The good news of the gospel of the kingdom is is real simple. It's the good news of the offer of salvation through the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. What does that look like? We'll take a look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He gives definition, the apostle Paul, in writing to the church at uh, Colossae. In the first chapter, he says, he, referring to, uh, referring to the Father, delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. How many of you know that is good news? That in the moment that you cross over the line and you, you let go and you let God take control, when you cross over the line and you profess Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, and you put your trust in Christ, to deal with the issues of sin that you and I are not capable in ourselves of dealing with. In that moment, he says, miraculously, you have been lifted out of the kingdom of darkness and you are put into the kingdom of God's dear son. You become a part of his family. You are adopted into his family as a son and a daughter. The work of Calvary is applied to your life because there is no such thing as universal salvation just because Jesus paid the price and paid the penalty for our sin at Calvary, it doesn't mean that automatically all of us are saved. See, God just made an offer through his son on the cross. But that offer has to be 
accepted. It has to be received. It has to be acted upon as an exercise of the human will. What just blows my mind is how the creator of the universe... I mean, we're talking about the creator of the planets. We're talking about the creator of, of every human being. Has such a high regard and respect for your choice and for human will that he does not violate our human will. He just makes us an offer over and over and over again. Every time the gospel is preached, an offer is being made to you and I. The good news is that anybody who puts their trust in Christ can receive eternal life, can make peace with God, can have the assurance of their eternal future, can understand what the kingdom looks like, not only in the there and the after, but in the here and the now, because he came to give you and I a foretaste of things to come. And that mandate of preaching was given to us in what we call the Great Commission in Mark chapter 16. There's actually two passages that give us a complete picture of what the commission looked like. And the commission was given not just for the leadership of the church, but for all believers. Matthew 28 covers the teaching component of the Great Commission. Mark 16, the preaching component. And he says in Mark 16, go into all the world, Jesus after his resurrection and prior to his ascension, he said, and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to every creature, every person, from all walks of life, from every nation, tribe, kindred, every tongue of people. I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to become a channel of the offer that I've given to you. I want you to share that offer with others with the understanding that there's different components here. A vast difference between the preaching of the word and the teaching of scripture. See, when preaching takes place, I want to submit to you this morning and suggest to you that it is a supernatural experience every time it takes place, whether in a large group of people or whether it's done one-on-one or in a small group. It is supernatural in origin. When preaching takes place, it is done for the purpose of inspiration. It is the lifting up of the voice that carries the very word of God to speak to the human heart, to affect the will so that you would make choices that would be consistent with God's purpose and plan for your life. How many of you believe this morning he has a plan? He's got a purpose. He has a destiny for your future. And every time you make a choice because the word has impacted your heart, you come that much more in alignment with his higher purpose and his higher plan for your life. Inspiration is the product of the preaching and the proclamation of the gospel to lift us to a higher place. Teaching, on the other hand, is for the application of truth, the systematic application of knowledge and spiritual truth in order to bring us to a place of having a foundation. And we need both of those to become well-rounded followers of Christ. But we've got an incredible example of the preaching aspect of this model in Acts chapter 2, verse 14. When the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost, the scripture tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, that Peter, who had denied Christ, who was wrestling with his own failures and shortcomings, the betrayal of his master, is filled with the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Spirit-filled experience because there is an endowment of power, a second work of the Spirit that equips you and I for ministry. The first work of the Spirit has to do with our salvation. The second work of the Spirit, as we see in the second chapter of the book of Acts, when the church was birthed, is for the purpose of ministry. God's Spirit working through us to preach, teach, heal, minister supernaturally for the purpose of touching people's lives and bringing people into the kingdom of God and 
carrying out God's purposes on planet Earth. Peter stands up as the Spirit of God comes upon him and gives him a new boldness, a new courage, a new unction. And the Scripture tells us he speaks. Now, Peter in that moment is not lecturing, church. He is not teaching. He is proclaiming. He preaches from two passages in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms and the book of Joel. And the Scripture says, and you need to circle this phrase, Leave that up there just for a moment. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. You don't want to miss this. Here's the phrase. The scripture says, he lifted up his voice. Can we put that scripture back up there? You guys following me? Acts 2, 14. He says, he lifted up his voice. Why? Because he was proclaiming the gospel. He was preaching under the unction of the Spirit, not his own words, but church, the very words of God himself. And it doesn't get any better than this for a a preacher and a proclaimer of truth. These men who were in the marketplace as the crowd was gathered were so convicted in their hearts of their sin. They asked Peter, Peter, what do, we need, what do we need to do to be saved? How should we respond to the message you are proclaiming? And the scripture said that 3,000 in that moment committed their lives to Christ. 3,000 said yes to God. 3,000 took him up on that offer. And that was the birth of Christianity as we know it. Through what vehicle? Following what model? The ministry of Jesus through the preaching of the good news of the gospel that was entrusted to Peter in that moment. And we see that over and over again as a pattern in the book of Acts. That's how the church flourished. That's how churches were planted as they went out and did missionary work. And they got outside of Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And Antioch, the first daughter church of Jerusalem, was birthed because of the preaching of the gospel. We see it as a pattern in the the epistles. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Can a man see himself as a damned sinner without emotion? There was a lot of emotion on that day. Can a man look into hell without emotion? Can a man listen to the thunderings of the law and feel nothing? Can a man really contemplate the love of God in Christ Jesus and feel no emotion? The whole position is utterly ridiculous. What is preaching? Logic on fire. Preaching is theology coming through a man who is on fire. Pray that I would be on fire, church. I say again that a man who can speak about these things dispassionately has no right whatsoever in a pulpit and should never be allowed to enter one. William Baxter said, I preached as never sure to preach again, as a dying man to dying men. What are we talking about? We're talking about the preaching, the proclamation of the gospel, a pattern that was repeated over and over and over again in the early church. It's the pattern that the church should be following today. The proclamation of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ was so important to the Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament that he said, and I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 as we let the word speak to us this morning. In verses 1 and 2, he said to Timothy who was one of the up-and-coming pastors, who had a calling of God in his life. Some of you have a calling of God in your life to be pastors, missionaries, teachers. And God's been stirring your heart. He said to Timothy, who was a young upstart, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing, and his kingdom. Timothy, preach the word with exclamation. Be instant, be ready in season and out of season. No matter where you are in the season of your life as a Christian, you are called to be ready to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And I want to draw your attention this morning to the reality of the, the, the original word and the ancient text for preach is the word keruso, which literally means to cry out, to proclaim, to herald. Say that with me this morning, to herald. It's distinct from the Greek word didasko, which means to teach. And in our series, we'll get to the teaching. But it begins first with the preaching and the proclamation of the word. And one of the images it is giving to us in the original language is that of a herald. It is a powerful metaphor that describes the role of the preacher, a means to proclaim a message, as a herald did in ancient days before radio and television. The imperial herald would enter a town on behalf of the emperor or the king, would make a public proclamation of the message which his sovereign ordered him to give, doing so with such formality, gravity, and authority as must be heeded. He would come and say, hear ye, hear ye. And all would give attention to and listen because they knew that the message that was going to be shared was a message from the king himself. And the herald would announce a great victory, a royal wedding, a new law that was to be enacted. He gave the people exactly what the emperor bade him to give. Nothing more and nothing less. And certainly not what the people wanted to hear. The ancient heralds proclaimed the emperor's message without alteration or addition, lest they lose their very life. They were not allowed to add or subtract from that message. They were not allowed to give their opinion regarding the message, simply to carry the message of the king. They had two responsibilities. Number one, get the message straight. And number two, speak it plainly so there'd be no misunderstanding. When the herald came into a village or a town, he was carrying a message from outside. In the case of preaching, we bring a message from outside. We bring God's message, the message of the gospel. It's different than any other form of communication. The message is God's own words. It's been referred to as the audacity of preaching. How is it? That a man or a woman could stand and proclaim God's own words when they themselves are sinful and broken. And make declaration of eternal truth. That's a paradox. Yet the assumption that is made in this dynamic is that each one of us, as we proclaim the gospel, are a part of the problem to which we bring a solution to bear upon. The subject matter is different. No other human organization on planet Earth addresses the issues of eternal life and eternal death the way that the church of Jesus Christ does. Karl Barth said, preaching is human language in and through which God himself speaks like a king through the mouth of his herald, which moreover is meant to be heard and apprehended. It is the hearing of a voice beyond the pastor or the preacher's voice. Thus, preaching is not about the voice of the pastor. And all of you said amen. I'd like to think you've come to hear me this morning. But I know better. You have come because somehow you believe that the words that I will speak from the Scripture are the very words of God Himself. And the reason this is crucially important is as Paul says in in 2 Timothy, and let's honor the text this morning, that the urgency to preach the gospel is because you and I are rapidly approaching, in verse 1, 
a day of judgment. And that day will come at Christ's appearing where he said that he will judge Jesus, the living and the dead. And there is only one way to prepare yourself for that day of judgment. It's by responding to the offer that God makes of eternal life, forgiveness of sin, pardon that Christ provided through the substitutionary atonement that he accomplished on the cross when he paid the penalty for the sins and the crimes that you and I could not pay. Let there be no mistake, none of us will stand before God and say, the good outweighed the bad. I ought to be here because I gave and I served. Those are a product of your salvation. They are not a means to your salvation. When Jesus said, it is finished. I'm here to tell you, church, the good news is that you don't have to pay the penalty. You don't have to try to resolve your sin and the penalty of your sin. Christ took care of that over 2,000 years ago. And that day is coming rapidly. In Matthew 24, when Jesus was speaking to his disciples about end time events and the end of the world, he said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. He said, and then the end will come. Then the day of judgment will be unveiled. And I want to wrap up this morning by looking at Romans chapter 10 which is a powerful picture for you and I of the impact of the preaching of the gospel. In Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, says, what does it say in verse 8? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Notice verse 13. Here's the offer. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't call on my name. Don't call on your husband's name. Don't call on your wife's name. Your mother, your father. You need to call on the name of the Lord. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How should they preach unless they are sent We believe in the calling of the preaching ministry of Jesus Christ. Some of you have that calling upon your life. As it is written, he's quoting now from the book of Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I have no capacity to help you believe. You have no mechanism within you and within your human nature to produce faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And in our culture, preaching has been marginalized. It has been at times despised and set aside. Yet we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, that God has chosen the foolishness of preaching. The foolishness of proclamation, of the heralding of his word to confound the wisdom of men and to accomplish his purposes and his plans. What's the offer? If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, he died, he rose from the dead, you shall be saved. Whoever calls on that name has hope in this life and the life to come. In other words, whenever the gospel is preached, an offer is being made. 
Some of you have still not taken him up on that offer. Some of you listening online, you've not yet said yes to him. It's not about rules and regulations and ritual and religion. It's about a relationship with the creator. And when Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, no man can reach the Father by except through me or by me, he was giving you and I a very clear pathway to experiencing that relationship. Is that exclusive? Absolutely. When you look at the claims of Jesus through the preaching of the gospel, as C.S. Lewis said, you only have three options. Jesus pinned you and I in through the claims he made and through the model of ministry he presented to force you and I to make a choice. When the offer is being made, you got three choices. He's either a lunatic because of the things he claimed, he's a liar, or he is the Lord. You choose today, because there's only two ways for you and I to get right with God. There's only two ways for us to experience eternal life. There's only two ways for you and I to come back into right relationship with him and to be adopted into his family. You live a perfect life or you trust in a perfect Savior. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here this morning, you say, Michael, I want that relationship. I want that peace. I want that assurance. I want to know that I know that I know that I am right with him, that my eternal future has been secured. Then put your hand up and say, pray for me. I want to make a decision to say yes to him. If you've never done that before, put your hand up. I want to pray for you. If you're listening online, you need to take that step this morning. The offer's been made. It's been laid out before you today. You need to accept him as Lord and Savior. And you want him to be Lord of your life. Put your hand up real quickly. I want to pray for you. Are there any here this morning? Or maybe you're here and you've done that and you have gotten off track and you need to come back into alignment and rededicate your life to him, put your hand up and say, Michael, pray for me. Thank you. Others, you need to take that step this morning. Rededicate your life to Christ. And if you've done that before, thank you. You've committed committed your life to Christ. You don't have to get saved all over again. Because becoming a son or a daughter in the kingdom, that's that's a one-time step of faith that you make now sometimes we get off track and we need to come back into alignment and that's what a rededication is about we rededicate our life to him and if you need to do that this morning again maybe you're listening online I want you to just pray this response of prayer with me let's do it as a congregation this morning say Lord Jesus I believe that's my profession of faith then on the third day you rose from the dead to give me life and to give it to me more abundantly. In this moment, Lord, I turn from my sin and I turn to you and I ask you for that peace. I ask you for that assurance of eternal life. Wash over my heart and my mind, Lord, and make all things new. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Let's congratulate those who did that either for the first time or as an act of rededication.